Remember the video about the shipwreck? Well, today I have a story that should, no pun intended, blow that one out of the water. You're not going to believe of what took place immediately following after the ship capsized. Today we have a very special guest, Renaissance man, joining us to talk about his part in the rescue of the trapped crew members on the Golden Ray ship. Can you tell me and the audience what your role was in helping the crew right after it capsized? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I guess I want to qualify all of this with saying that I was a really, really small part of a huge response, and I'm not I, I want to make sure I give full credit to everybody that was there, all the different agencies, Coast Guard, DNR, the fire department, uh, you know, our law enforcement, um, all the, the private uh, companies like CETO that were there. Um, there are so many people that that just showed up and made it happen. But I, I'm more than happy to tell uh, the story from my perspective, uh, which started with me trying to get some sleep. And I get a call from a friend of mine at four o'clock in the morning. And, uh, you know, we, we both went through all of our technical rescue training together mm -hmm. and, uh, he never calls me at weird hours. So when the phone rang at 4 AM, I'm like, this is a problem. So I answered immediately and he goes, Hey man, you want to rappel into an engine room on a ship and save some <laughs> Koreans? And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about, but let me get my pants on. <laughs> um, so I, I jump up and I get dressed and I call him. He's like, yeah, man, one of the, the row rows capsized in the sound i'm like you gotta be joking man i was like this is just surreal and uh so he's like man we got some guys going to grab some gear um, i'm going to wake up one of the other guys right now uh just meet me at the coast guard station so i, I get there and all the other technical rescue guys are there and uh i don't know like maybe 20 of the crew have already been rescued and they're uh, being dropped off at the DNR dock. And it was just a, the strangest feeling. So we go in to do like a little briefing with the crew and the Coast Guard to kind of come up with our uh, strategy. And uh, we're trying to ask the crew, you know, who's left on board? Who are we missing? And there's a language barrier. So um, I, I, could, I can't speak Korean. I, I guess that's what they speak. And then they can't speak English but we could speak a little bit of Mariner. So I could say, you know, like forward and aft and port and starboard and, you know, uh, aft of the beam or forward of the beam or whatever. And, uh, or poop deck, they kept saying poop deck. So I, I was like, all right, I'm with you. Um, <laughs> so they drew a little, uh, hand-drawn map on a piece of notebook paper. And they showed me that the, the chief engineer was all the way up forward on the port side in the cabin. And the cabin, uh, captain was in the all the way forward starboard side in the cabin. And then they had uh, approximately five guys down in an engine room. And he was showing me that it was uh, like three or four decks above the lowest deck on the ship. Um, uh -huh. So we uh, load a, a, a couple of us up on a Coast Guard boat and we go taken off into the sound. It's still pitch black dark. And uh, when we rounded the, the corner near Bird Island and we can see it, we can see smoke everywhere. Yeah. We're like, oh crap, this thing's on fire. It's not just capsized, but it's on fire. Yeah. And uh, it was just the most uh, surreal sight that you can imagine. I mean, there was already uh, tugboats and some Coast Guard assets uh, on scene. And we're just trying to size this thing up and really see what what's possible. And uh, we knew that probably making an entry in there and doing any kind of uh, long drawn out rescue effort was going to be more than likely off the table once we knew that there was a fire on board and the air quality was uh, not going to be ideal for human consumption. And we, uh, we also thought that it was probably unlikely that the crew was going to be uh, viable unless they were somehow sheltered from that, that smoke. Yeah. Um, it was, there's nothing on a ship that can burn and burn clean. It's not like it's some pine straw or something. It's mm. plastic and rubber and fuels and things that choke a human really, really quickly. Yeah. Um, not to mention there's things on ships that you have to worry about, like hydrogen sulfide, 
Um, and uh, who knows what else that could be uh, in that air. Exhaust fumes from equipment that's now not being vented properly. So uh, we waited until daylight. We were able to uh, get the chief engineer and the captain. And I spoke with the chief engineer and he kind of pointed to a door that led to a stairwell that went all the way down to the engine room where the guys were trapped. And um, so me and a, a Coast Guard swimmer that was now standing on the boat with us, we decided that we wanted to get as close as we could to the ship. And uh, we climb up the handrails, which are supposed to be horizontal, but now they're vertical. Yep. Because the ship's on its side. Yeah. And we're like, well, we can't repel down this elevator, uh, down the stairwell, because now the stairwell is also horizontal. So we'd have to you know, find some other kind of way to traverse that to get to these guys. And that's probably not possible with the air quality. Yeah. Uh, so the, what we had to do was at least rule out that those guys hadn't made their own way up that stairwell and were now sitting at the top behind a door just waiting on someone to open this door. Uh -huh. You got to think the door is made to swing when it's vertical. Yep. It's very heavy when it's now horizontal. Yeah. So if you're in the water or just hanging on to something, there's no way you could shove this door up. So yeah. I'm like, man, I, I cannot live knowing that, say, tomorrow they find those guys' bodies and they're behind that door. Yeah. And we didn't get up there and check that door. Yeah. Um, I was like, that, that's really the only thing that we can do right now today with the resources and the environment that we're dealing with. Um, but if that's all we can do, we have to at least do it. So me and the Coast Guard guy uh, jumped up there, scaled up these handrails and kind of butt slid down this wall and checked the door. When I got up there, I thought I heard banging, um, which got me kind of pumped up. But uh, I didn't hear it anymore. And it turns out it's probably just something falling inside of there and banging off of some walls or something. Um, and we, we checked that space and bang and bang and bang, trying to see if we could get a response. And we got nothing and uh, decided that it was it was best for us to not attempt any further rescue. And then later that day, they were able to uh, make contact by tapping on the bottom of the hull and uh -huh. find that the guys were alive. And that's when they called the team in from overseas to take it from there, which was a uh, which was the right thing to do um, if we had attempted anything the door that we went to check that was probably 30 or 40 feet off of the water at first, a few hours later was underwater. So it would have totally cut off our, uh, our ingress and egress point, And we would have been trapped in there too. Had we tried to be cowboys. Yeah. People around here go to the pier or go to Jackal beach or wherever. And they can see that thing. You're like, wow, that's a big ass boat and it's submerged, but that's an unbelievable story. Um, it's epic, dude. I mean, and I say that in positive terms because I know the end of this story is that nobody was killed, right? Yeah. And that you made it out okay. Right. Yeah. Um, what was the certification that you had? Well, yeah, I, all the guys are uh, fire and pretty much for the, for the most part have some kind of uh, EMS certification. So they're an EMT basic or an advanced EMT or paramedic. I was uh, and still am a... Uh, advanced DMT for at least like 34 more days. Okay. Um, but uh, it's, it's mainly the, the fire certs that come into play there. And uh, a lot of us went up and, and we did, uh, it's basically like heavy rescue training. They teach you how to use uh, ropes, pulleys, wedges, pry bars, and they mm -hmm. teach you how to do everything from like structural collapse yep. um, to confined space, uh, repelling, uh, packaging up patients and, and getting them in uh, in litters or trying to get some kind of sling around their body to hoist them out. Yeah, um, it's, it's quite a lot of stuff. And it's several, several weeks of training to get to that point. Um, and there's a, a growing number of guys that we have here that can that can do that kind of thing. Wow. And so that was all by virtue of your fire fireman training, firefighters. Yes. Training? Yeah. yes. Wow, dude, I. <laughs> That's just so much there. Um, so when y'all got there, was that the night, like the night it capsized? Yeah. So it, I guess it capsized like in the middle of the night and they started bringing in the, the technical rescue guys uh, at like 4 a.m. They started calling the roster. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, 
and you got a call. Hey, do you- <laughs> I yeah, dude, look, I had already, I'd already put in my two weeks notice and worked my last shift. Yeah. And uh, like I was growing my beard and I'm, you know, never going to ever put this uniform on again. And I got the call like, hey, you got one more thing to do, homeboy. Yeah. And I was like, man, I, and that's that's cool, man. That's how I wanted to end my career. But I told uh, my buddy, my buddy that I was on the boat with, um, we were out there with the Coast Guard. I was like, man, I did five years in the Navy and however many years in the fire service. And if you let me die in a fire on a ship, I will haunt you forever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it was cool, man. It was it was cool to have one last two raw with the guys. Now that everything, you know, everybody turned out to be okay, yep. you know, no loss of human life. Um, yep. It's like just having one last two raw with the guys was was really cool. Yeah, God, I'm kind of I'm kind of in shock a little bit right now. I just didn't know what what all went into the rescue mission and how dire things got. I knew that for days those guys were trapped on the boat, right? Yeah, yeah, several days. I think maybe three. Yeah. But, you know, because the guys that had to get flown in from overseas, uh, they had to cut an inspection hole, mm-hmm. uh, drop something in there to test the air quality. But you got to think, you know, if there's some kind of fuel leak in there and you got gases building up and then you start cutting into a boat with a torch, um, you can <laughs> compound the problem pretty fast. So you have to know what that what the, the mixture of chemicals is in that air. So then they cut it a little bit at a time to where they can actually access that space yep. and uh, drop in there and get those guys. And I mean, they're incredibly fortunate that um, that it was on its side in about 40 feet of water. Had it been 60 feet of water, the that probably would have been a, a death sentence. Mm-hmm. 20 more feet of water in that part of the ship would have been underwater. And you got to think, uh, how do you walk when a ship's on its side? You know, none of your none of your decks are where they're supposed to be. The walls are now the decks. Right. So you could just be stepping along and then all of a sudden you make a, you know, a, a 80 foot drop. Yeah. And it's pitch black dark. You yeah. know, none of the none of the engineering spaces, none of the generators that generate electricity to keep the inside of that thing lit are going. So these guys are in a dark, hot, hot, hot environment. Yeah. I mean, it's a metal ship with no air conditioning because nothing's running bacon in the summer sun. Uh, I mean, what an awful environment, but yeah, just a few more feet of water and that would have spelled death for him for sure. Yeah. Holy shit, man. That that's miraculous. Did, did they communicate with you or your team when they came out or, I mean, um, you know that- there were some guys, there were some guys there, um, when the, the team that they flew in, uh, came. There were some guys there to help them run the rigging and stuff. It takes quite quite a few people to run a a uh, a, a rig to to lower and and hoist people, and they used some of our guys there. But I was done at that point. Yeah, um, you uh, reached your two weeks or no? Well, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I was I was out. There was uh, they they had the people there uh, to do it and. They didn't need me anymore, and uh, they've they've got more than enough qualified people to do that. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, they they came in, and it was the the specialist team running the show. So we did have some guys that were there when they brought the guys out, but I'm not sure what kind of contact they had with them or anything. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> but I do, I do remember watching the video, and that last guy that they got out he wanted that water bottle. I remember seeing him, they handed him a water bottle and like he didn't have the hand strength to open it. So he grabbed the, the cap with his teeth. I uh-huh. was trying to twist it open. He's like, I just want some water. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, he's in his underwear at this point. Cause so and damn hot, right? out of three days of, uh, hot, humid darkness. And you got to think, man, he didn't know how deep the water was there. He's probably thinking, man, are we on the bottom? You know, are we 80 yeah. feet below the surface? He doesn't know. His, his entire, he's completely disoriented, completely cut off. And then all of a sudden he's brought out into the daylight and he gets to look at everything for the first time and, and see where he was. And even he's in his underwear, surrounded by people, and all he wants is water. <laughs> you know, it's like just the most basic element for human survival. He was at that point. Yeah. I mean, you can't, that's not, that's nothing you can really, anybody could describe to anybody else. You just have to 
you have to be there in that position to know what that's like. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, but thank God oh, yeah. back to Korea or wherever he's from. Um, so you said there were, there was only one part of the ship in which the um, guys were trapped, right? Right. Yeah. Except for the, the captain and the chief engineer, um, they were way up forward, uh, uh -huh. like one deck below the, the pilot house. Uh -huh. um, which is where all their cabins are. So they're more up in the superstructure of the ship. Yep. And they were able just to like slide down and jump on a boat. Um, okay. There's really no. And yeah, so nobody had to go get them. Actually, they just kind of slid down to the, the water line and jumped onto a boat. Um, those other guys were, if you look at the boat where the, the prop shaft goes into the hull, that's more or less where they were. Um, pretty, pretty close. So way, way down near the keel uh all the way aft damn boiler room <laughs> pretty much yeah mm -hmm. um and the you said the engineer and the cap captain were they both korean yeah oh so they didn't speak english either no no the the chief engineer was a was an older guy yeah. and uh we got him on the coast guard boat with us and i'm trying to stand beside him and like uh, we're looking at the top deck of the ship so we're like on the saint simon's side of where the the ship lay and I'm going, show me where a door is to get to those guys. And he looks at it and he goes, uh, which way aft? And I'm <laughs> like, dude, you work on this ship. You should be able to look at it, know which side's the bow and which side's the stern. Yeah. So I was like, that way's aft. He's like, Oh, okay. Uh, so see poop deck. And I'm like, Oh yeah. Okay. Got it. Poop deck. Anyway, we wound up getting it narrowed down, but I mean, he was, he was pretty old and feeble and, uh, like he couldn't see well enough to even see which end was which on the ship. So uh, I was just thinking, wow, man, I was thinking I'd be able to get give me the chief engineer. The chief engineer is the guy I need to talk to. And then he's like, which way aft? I was like, oh, boy, this is going to be a long morning. I mean, yeah, I think he just couldn't see it. I think that was the main thing. You know what I mean? It, was, it, was, it, it, just, it doesn't have a, like an extreme pointy end or anything, so. Yeah. I mean, if your vision's a little blurry, I, I get it. But I just thought that was funny, man. I thought I got the guy. Like, here's the guy that's going to get me where I need to go. And then he can't see which end of the ship is which. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that turned out to be a minor hurdle among many. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, well, that is a great, incredible story, man. I think a debt of gratitude is owed to you and all the folks that were on the on the mission out there. Um, the people yeah, that... Not, not me, man, but... Uh, but for sure, there there's a a whole uh, a whole gang of dudes that would gladly go uh, risk their lives if they if they thought it would make a difference um, for somebody else. And um, you know, I, I appreciate you you know thinking that I would be a good person to to tell the story. But um, I can assure you, if the guys thought for a second that I was trying to to beat my own chest or uh, or or call myself anything other than just old dirtbag sailor fireman. I assure you, I would never hear the end of it, but um, they, they definitely deserve a ton of credit. They go through a lot of training, a lot of preparation for events that might never even happen. Um, and I'm glad that there's guys that are, are willing to be so diligent uh, just in case things like this happen. Yeah. But, well, gratitude to them as well. And I think you've covered your, covered your ass here <laughs> so, you so. across like probably it morning. probably doesn't even matter they're probably gonna get me anyway well i anything you want to tell me to do or not do with the final product of this video just let me know and i'll oh uh, no 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 it's fine brother you just you do what you need to do um okay well what's your youtube channel called again that's the georgia fishing company all right so if somebody's watching this video wants to check out hot tips yeah, stuff Fishing reports, uh, how-to videos, how to rig up, uh, pretty much everything's Georgia and Golden Isles specific. So Okay, perfect. So if you find yourself in Southeast Georgia in need of fishing advice or tips, Georgia Fishing Company is the place to look. That's right. YouTube. I'm sure there are a lot of lost people that try to go fishing around here. Uh, yeah, yeah. And this, the, that's not the ones you have to worry about. The ones you have to worry about are the ones that think they already know it all. Yeah. Those are, that's your problem, child. It, it's a lot to know. So any anybody that I was I was lucky, man. I had 
so many people in my life growing up that taught me how to fish. It was just something that uh, it was like an inherent skill yeah. um, that I was I was brought up immersed in. So somebody that maybe sees fishing as a hobby that they'd like to learn. So it's a uh, it's a lot to figure out. So I try to leave those resources for people that um, maybe didn't have a dad that took them fishing or didn't have a whole bunch of uncles or dudes in their life to, to help them with that. They can go find my, my blog or my YouTube channel and hopefully close that gap a little faster. Yeah. Yeah. My dad wasn't around when I was growing up, so he, he passed, he didn't leave, but um, he was huge into fishing, but I, I think he was, he was gone by the time it was about time to teach me. So yeah, well, I am your target market. That's, that's valuable. Right on, man. I got 200 pages on my website. You can use to your advantage. Yeah, well, I will definitely look at look more at your videos. And I'll leave a description uh, for your channel in the link. The least I can do for you joining me here. Um, um, but that, that's the interview portion for you people watching, all 10 of you. Um, I'm going to stop the recording.